name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among them, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now at the hour of death. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. Let's pray. O God, it instruct the hearts of your faithful. By the light of the Holy Spirit, granted by the same Spirit, may be truly wise, never rejoice in this consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Lady Guadalupe. Pray for us. Saint Joseph. Pray for us. Voluntary. Pray for us. Saint Nacia Loyola. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. St. Augustine, pray for us. all God's angels and saints. Pray for us. Start with a prayer from Psalm 1. Happy those who do not follow the counsel of the wicked, nor go the way of sinners, nor sit in company with scoffers. Rather, the law of the Lord is their joy. God's law they study day and night. They are like a tree planted near streams of water. It yields its fruit into a season. Its leaves never wither. Whatever they do prosper, but not the wicked. They are like chaff driven by the wind. Therefore the wicked shall not survive judgment, nor will sinners in the assembly of the just. The Lord watches over the way of the just, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. Please be seated. Good morning. About two weeks ago, I was giving you a theological summary of one of the documents of Vatican II. And that document was Perfecti Caritatis, which uh, in English means perfect charity. And there are 16 documents from Vatican II, and I recommend that you buy the Austin Flannery version to get a good, really good translation of it. And um, as is usually the case, I always feel that whenever I'm explaining some theological concept, I feel that I'm always leaving it kind of um, half done you know, uh, for lack of time. And I, did not, I didn't have the time to explain a key element of religious life, and that is, it's called uh, charism. Now, some of you have probably heard of the charismatic movement, okay? Uh, charism is its, its specific physiognomy, if you like, of the founder that God chooses to establish an order. Okay, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Hmm? I'll put it in, in common English, that each founder is given a special uh, spirituality that he transmits to uh, the church, and God chooses him to be the founder. For example, the founder of the Dominicans, his name is St. Dominic, Order of Preachers. Founder of the Benedictines would be St. Benedict. Founder of the Jesuits is St. Ignatius, the founder of um, the Oblates is uh, Father Bruno Lanteri. Okay? You have what are the major orders and congregations. Congregations, you have the major order, then the congregations, basically, they branch off from the major orders, okay? The Carmelites. Okay, that being said, la, leading you, leading us to our topic this morning is the Oblates of the Virgin Mary that are the priests that have this parish at our, uh, and under our wings, so to speak, uh, we have a charism, and our charism is giving, giving the spiritual exercise of St. Ignatius, and I think most of you have gone through them, program that I created about 11 years ago, and also Marian Consecration, many of you have gone through the Consecration program the one that I've composed also. Many of you also, also part of our charism is the formation of priests. Uh, Father Tim Gallagher is probably the oblate that's doing it most in the country 
given seminars and retreats to seminaries and priests throughout the world, even in other countries. Um, also, our charism is that of the formation of the laity, which means you people, which is our obligation to try to form the laity that God has placed, um, placed in, our, in our formation. Uh, also, another would be that of the, uh, the apostolate of mercy through spending long hours in the confessional. Uh, that's part of our charism. Also is the spreading of good literature. You notice every time I'm giving a talk, I'm mentioning at least five books for you to read. That comes from the fact that I have a degree in English literature. That's a pretty good foundation. But also part of our charism as Oblates is to try to get people to read good books. Now, our founder lived from 1759 to 1830. So he lived in a time when you didn't have TV and radio and the internet that didn't exist. So back then, the basic means of communication was preaching. You'd have popular missions, it would be jam-packed. The people would sometimes come to be entertained by the preacher, you know. But also, uh, it would be that of books, articles, and literature. So back 170 years ago, reading was very key. And just that you know, back when my founder lived, it was a time in which eventually the Industrial Revolution would change the face of Europe, where instead of living in an agrarian society of farmers, they were moving to the Orbe, which is the city, and there would be radical changes. And that's why you got John Bosco working with young people, and you have Charles Dickens writing novels against the, the Industrial Revolution, as well as some of the English poets of the 19th century. Okay, I've, I've arrived at, I've arrived at the, the charism I'd like to express today in theological and philosophical terms is our charism is try to detect the major heresies of the day and try to... Uh, decapitate them, if I can use that strong word. In other words, to have the pulse of the society to see what's going on in the world and see what are the major heresies that are rocking the bark of Peter. Now, in the time of St. Dominic, it was Albigensianism. In the time of St. Augustine in the fourth century, it was Manichaeism, Donatism, as well as Arianism. Those were, those were philosophical, theological heresies that, were, that Augustine had to fight against, no? Uh, my founder, uh, the, the basic heresy that was rocking the boat in the um, 18th, 19th century was a philosophy called Jansenism. Okay? In this country, it was called Puritanism. The time of Augustine is called Manichaeism. It's basically the same thing, just changing names, no? which is, it basically, it basically, it's dualism. Matter is evil, spirit is good. The essence of it. Okay, I've given you a long introduction, so what I'd like to do today is this. Try to make a bridge between philosophy and theology. Okay? So that's, I'm going to try to talk about that, these two lectures this morning. A, a bridge between philosophy and theology. And if you have a degree in philosophy, you know the basic axiom. Philosophy is the handmaid of theology. That's scholasticism. Philosophy is the handmaid of theology. So we as priests, for example, I have a, have a degree in English literature before I entered, but I have, a degree in, I have a degree in philosophy too. Not a doctorate, but I've got a two-year degree. And then I have my degree in, in theology. So all priests, maybe you don't know, well, priests have to study philosophy too. Did you know that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. We have to study philosophy. Uh, it's usually two or sometimes three years, and then the philosophy is usually 
double that in you know, four to five years. So we have to study philosophy. So many, okay, many of the theological heresies come from a false philosophy. Okay, that's my that's the purpose of my talks this morning. Many many false theologies come from a false philosophy. So they're intertwined. That's why I feel I feel in honor of the fact that I was able to study uh, all, all of my philosophy and theology at the Angelicum where John Paul II studied years before me. And uh, who were the teachers were the Dominicans? And who's, the, who's the greatest philosopher and theolo theologian in the world? It was Thomas Aquinas. So I feel humbly honored the fact that I was to be able to study with, with uh, Dominican teachers that were trying to transmit, and they were good teachers, the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas as his, well as his theology. Don't forget, Th Thomas Aquinas was a theologian, but he was a first class philosopher too. And they say in the modern world, uh, John, John Paul II was, was more a philosopher, well, it was, philosophy was a strong point. Whereas Benedict XVI, theology was a, was a strong point. John Paul II relied a lot upon Thomas, and uh, Saint, as well as Benedict relied a lot upon Augustine. No? Okay, so I think, I think that it, t today, so my founder is Febrianism and Jansenism were the two basic heresies back in the um, 18th and 19th century. Now, there are so many heresies, I don't even know where to start. If you, if you want, I could, without any preparation whatsoever, I could give you probably an, an hour and a half talk on the heresies with respect to the sacramental life, without any preparation. I'd wing it. <laughs> I'd probably give an A-plus talk on it. Uh, just in the sacraments, no? Uh, but that was not, that's gonna, not going to be my focus. It's going to be more philosophical, more general. And from these, um, from these philosophical errors, they insinuate, themsel insinuate themselves into the, um, the, uh, into the theology. Okay, so I, I was able to, in um, my room this morning, I was able to write out uh, 10 uh, even though there are many more. Okay? I might just throw out a few others after the second lecture. But I'd like to throw out uh, 10 false philosophies. Okay, let's start with Augustine now. Every person in this world has a philosophy. They don't know it, but every person has a philosophy. Every person. They're not philosophical enough to understand what I'm saying, but the, everyone has a philosophy. So one of the greatest thinkers, Augustine says this, I think I quoted it a couple weeks ago, is he says that Aquinas says that we're all called to be happy. Do you people want to be happy? Yes. Or is there one day a week when you want to be sad? No, no we, we want to be happy 24-7, right? We want to be happy. Okay. Why is it then that so many people are everything but happy? Because they have a false principle and foundation. And they have a false philosophy. Because they're looking for happiness where, where happiness cannot be found. So like the lady that was looking for his, her keys. You ever lose your keys? Yes. She's looking at her keys in the garage, uh, on the top of the refrigerator, in the refrigerator, and finally she found her in the, the, the keys in her purse. Okay, They were there, okay? So she was looking all over the place for her keys, and she found them hidden somewhere in her purse. People want to be happy, but they're pursuing happiness in the wrong place. So here's the Augustinian classic. 
which is in the Liturgy of the Hours, one of the readings. Augustine says, Lord, you have made our hearts for thee. Our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, taken from the confessions. Also, Augustine says, we're all called to love. We're all called to love. The heart is called to love. But we have to choose wisely the object of our love than to love with all our hearts. Amen? Amen. Isn't that beautiful? That's St. Augustine. We're all called to love. But we have to choose wisely the object of our love then we have to love with all our heart. So the principal reason for sadness in the world is that people are looking for love in the wrong place. Drinking, sex, drugs, alcohol, buying, eating, vacationing. Not that not that, uh, not that all of these are intrinsically evil. But if we place them as number one in our lives, that becomes what is called a modern idol. Okay? A modern idol. If we are giving more importance to something that is relatively unimportant, that's the nature of idolatry. So let's, uh, let's, let's kick off. Okay, the first prevalent, erroneous, philosophical system, which is very prevalent, especially in this country, is that of materialism. Materialism. The essence and basis of life consists in having material things. There's my definition, okay? Succinct, concise definition that Father Broom composed this morning, okay? The essence and basis of life is having material things. If you like, the more you have, the better off you are. Do you think any, anyone in this country embraced that philosophy? Probably 90%, right? So the more you have, the better, you, the better off you are. How many people pursue as their end all money buying and having? Most people in this country. It's not to say that having things is wrong, but if that becomes our end all, our raison d'etre, as they say in French, the reason for our being, <laughs> there's something out of place. Okay, in my course of the exercises, I've quoted, I haven't quoted him in a couple of years, but I'll quote him again. His name is Eric Fromm. Okay, any of you who know, who've studied psychology have heard of that modern psychologist, Eric Fromm. He's coined this profound statement, which basically summarizes the point. If you are what you have, and you lose what you have, who are you? Okay, I'll repeat. If you are what you have, and you lose what you have, who are you? Jeannie? Nothing. My parents were born in the time of the Cristeros, in the United States, it was the big economic depression. My mom and dad, my 20, 1928, 1931, right? They were born in, in that time in the country. You know American history, people lost their money like that. Wall Street crashed. And people were throwing themselves out the windows in, in, in New York City. Why? Because their life depended upon what they had. And they lost it. So the logical philosophical conclusion, this is philosophical and theological, I don't have anything, what's the purpose of living? End it, just end it. There are people that embrace that today and they commit suicide. Very prevalent. 
So I'm going to try to do, I'm, uh, I'll give you the, the erroneous philosophical system, and I'll give you the contrary. The contrary is the beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of God. And I'll give you another biblical verse and I'll give you some classical literature. Okay? Some classical literature to uh, flesh this out. Okay? Another one, biblical passage, is Luke chapter 16. And it is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man, he had it all. He had it all. He would eat, he would drink, he was well-dressed, he was comfortable. He was a typical materialist. He exemplifies the essence of materialism is this, this parable. Jesus is a great preacher and teacher, isn't he? Hmm? Yes. And what's interesting is that this man ends up in the the fiery pit, and Lazarus ends up in the bosom of Abraham. Why did he end up in the fiery pit? Not so much for what he did do, but for what he failed to do. That is called the sin of omission. You go to Mass, you say, I, I've sinned in thought, word, deed, and omission. Thought, word, deed, and omission. Okay. With respect to classical literature, the most famous novelist in the 19th century, his name was Charles Dickens. Okay? And probably his most famous work would be not Oliver Twist, but rather it would, or David Copperfield, but rather The, the Christmas Carol. In cinema, I think it's probably the movie that's been duplicated most. There's probably been at least 10 different versions of, uh, of this classic. All of you have heard of The Christmas Carol, right? Some of you about to have a baby, don't name your baby, baby Ebenezer nor Scrooge. <laughs> I know sooner or later I'm going to be baptizing Ebenezer or Scrooge. It hasn't happened yet because they're very creative in naming babies today, no? To the point of being ridiculous, no? And the essence of that is what? Here you have a man, he's a, he's a materialist. He's a materialist. The only, thing that he, the only thing he cares about is money. Money and accumulating. He's got a worker, Bob Cratchit. You maybe saw the movie, maybe read the classic text. Making him work until midnight Christmas Eve. Penny pinching, huh? Then this is the very nation. What happens? He's got a dream. Of Marley the ghost, huh? Which he takes him to rewind the film of his life, seeing his past, how he took advantage of, of people, hoarding money, the present, not any better. And then the ghost takes him to the cemetery with his bony finger points to the tombstone. You see Ebenezer Scrooge, the year he was born, and the day he's going to die with a question mark. He wakes up, and he opens up the window, snowflakes are falling, little boy is dragging the sled, and he says to the boy, my son, is the fat turkey still in the marketplace? Okay. Yes, sir. So he throws a sum of money out there, the little boy catches it, bring me back the fat turkey. He brings him back the fat turkey, and he goes to Bob Cratch's house, knocks on the door, one of the children opened up the door, petrified, feeling that the, dad, the daddy's in the doghouse now. 
And he says, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. Where's Tiny Tim? Hmm? The story of conversion. By an encounter of death. Very nation. Hmm? But the encounter with death. So there you have materialism. Mother Teresa tells us we're called to give until it hurts. Give until it hurts. Okay, the next, the, the second erroneous philosophical system is that of consumerism. You notice there's an interconnection between materialism and consumerism. One spawns the other. One is the daughter of the other. So look at the connection. If you have material things, if you have money, then you can buy and consume, right? It's logical, isn't it? You ever hear the saying, shop until you drop? (laughs) Ever hear that, baby? (laughs) Shop until you drop, huh? Okay, what exemplifies this erroneous philosophy best in the United States is Black Friday. Is that true? It's Black Friday. Remember last year, it was, it was Thursday, uh, it was Thanksgiving Day, me and Father Craig and Father Dave went, to, went bowling, and then there was a, we got out about five o'clock, and there was a, um, a mall, and there was a store right next to the bowling alley. And the line was, it was so long. I told Father Craig and Father Dave, hey, let's go and get our stoles, huh? <laughs> 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 let's divide the line into three, Craig, Davey. I'll take this one here. I'll take the cholos, you take the... <laughs> I'll take the chole, you take the last one. <laughs> hmm. I was tempted to do that, no? Yeah. Yeah. My religious habit after my, my bowling game, put the stole on them. No? You know, they, hey, hey, listen, listen. Shop until you drop. I, I can't give you forgiveness free of charge. <laughs> 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 Okay, related to that, uh, this probably happened about seven or eight years ago, and it, it, it left an indelible impression upon me when I heard this. No? Uh, I, I don't have enough time to, to read a lot of newspapers. I just don't have time. No? I try to pick up you know, the details of what's going on in the world. No? But years ago, it was... Um, it was Black Friday, and I think they open up the doors. Do they open up the doors at midnight sometimes? Okay. Okay, you all, you all have experience. I don't have experience. Huh? Okay, and this is what happened. It was in a Walmart in uh, either New York City or the, the state of New York. And um, so they opened up the door. New York is like LA, you got tons of people. Okay? And the people rushed in like a like a stampede of buffaloes, no? Ever see buffaloes? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they rushed in, you know, shouldering and shoving people, and they they knocked one of the guys down who worked there, one of the workers, and they stampeded on the poor guy. And they killed him. 
Do you remember that? Yes. Must have been like maybe 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago, something like that. And I heard that and I, I, almost, I almost wanted to weep. But the worst thing was this. If I don't finish the story, it's incomplete. Uh, is that the man was killed. The owner of that Walmart, a good man obviously, decided to close down the Walmart for, to grieve for one of his workers. So he closes the door and the people clamored outside, clamored outside, demanding that they had a right to still buy even though they ended by killing one of the workers. That says a lot. What does that say? No <laughs> the, the, the things, material things, prevail over the human person. That is a wrong philosophical idea which is very prevalent. Human person has infinite value. Every one of you here, as well as your children, every one of you here, individually, as well as your child or children, are worth more than the whole created universe. You hear me? Yes. And I'm not using hyperbole either. Every one of you has infinite value because you're created in the image and likeness of God and you're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. As St. Peter says in the first encyclical in the Catholic Church, that you are redeemed and saved, not by calves or bulls, or by gold or silver, but you're redeemed by the, by the blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And as taught in the exercises, if Jesus had to come and shed every drop of his precious blood for you, he would do it again, and he'd do it another million times. That's how important you are in the eyes of God. But that, that manifests how, how, how people, uh, uh, the, the materialistic person, devalues life. See, the, the, this philosophy overflows into theology, and theology into decisions, and decisions into actions, and actions into habits. And habits form our personality, and eventually that forms our destiny. Could you repeat that? <laughs> our thoughts form decisions. Our decisions form actions. A repeated action is a habit. A good habit is a, vir is, is, a, is a virtue, a bad habit is a vice. That forms our personality, who we are. And that will eventually determine our destiny, our eternal destiny, which is either salvation or eternal damnation. You got the, you got the sequence there? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's, uh, that's uh, and I'll give you a biblical passage. A biblical passage that is the contrary. It's the parable, it's the parable of the rich fool. A man had an abundant harvest. He didn't know what to do with it because his barn was too small. He did some brainstorming, came to the conclusion he was going to tear down his barns and silos and to construct, to build barns that would reach the skies. And then after he said, my soul, my soul, relax, eat and drink, you have a long life. And Jesus says, you are a fool.
because this very night your life is going to be asked of you. And that leads me into the next erroneous philosophical system, which is hedonism. Hedonism. Okay, what is hedonism? This is a philosophical system that states that life is meant for the purpose of simply enjoying yourself, for maximizing pleasure, for giving full reign to the senses and the flesh. Okay? Sound very American? <laughs> it certainly is, no? So this morning I was able to kind of do some brainstorming and put together some modern American proverbs, aphorisms, okay? One-liners, which kind of synthesize this concept. You ever go to a, uh, to a restaurant in Southern California, what does the waitress say? Enjoy, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Que disfrute. <laughs> Enjoy. Others? Live it up! Another? Go for it. Carpe diem. Remember the movie? Next? Are you ready now? It's Miller time! <laughs> You just have a break, break to date McDonald's, huh? And here's probably the best. You have one life to eat. Eat, drink, and be merry. I'm going to throw a curveball at you now, okay? That actually comes from St. Paul. Did you know that? St. Paul, in one of his letters, goes on to say, if there is no resurrection, is there, if there is no life beyond the grave, St. Paul says, eat, drink, and be merry. You only have one life to live, enjoy your life to the maximum. If, he says, if there is no life beyond the grave. He says that we are the most miserable of all creatures if there's nothing beyond the grave. But then Paul, of course, is going to say we believe in the resurrection of Christ. So he's living in a time where there are people, because St. Paul is, is, is a Greek, okay? And he speaks Greek, rather. Romans says, but he speaks Greek. There were people that denied God's existence back 2,000 years ago. Okay. All of these proverbs and false philosophies can easily insinuate themselves into our moral veins and poison us almost unawares like the frog heated up and boiled to death gradually in the bathtub. Know that example? You put a frog in a bathtub and you start to boil it up and before you know it, the, the, the frog is boiled to death. In psychology, it's called desensitized, okay? You become calloused, desensitized. Okay, let's give the opposite virtue then. What is the opposite virtue to hedonism? Hello? A little bit of charades this morning, okay? <laughs> Obviously. No brainer, huh? The opposite of hedonism is the doctrine of the cross. So, you, you know, you, you, we live with a lot of hedonists. You talk about, you talk about a, the cross to a hedonist? Impossible to understand. 
They think you're, you think you're crazy. You know, suffering, carrying the cross, self-denial, the ascetical life, fasting, practice and discipline. Are you living in the Middle Ages? Wake up and smell the coffee. You're living in the United States, 2019. Come on, eat, drink, and be merry. Live it up. You got one life to live. It's Miller time. Come on, let's go to La Fiesta, La Pechanga. Let's go. Come on. <laughs> Enough of this medieval, obsolete, archaic asceticism. You know. What are you, an advertisement for Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales? Come on, wake up. <laughs> Then I was able to write down one of the uh, Sheen classics. She, 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 Sheen has got so many uh, good ones. And this is what Fulton Sheen says. No Good Friday, no Easter Sunday. Hello? No Good Friday, no Easter Sunday. Then I remember in one of his talks, I was able to write down something he said after that. <laughs> he said, it's either the feast or party, then the headache or the hangover, or it's the fast and then the feast. I kind of like that. I repeat, it's either the, the feast, the headache, I wrote in parentheses the hangover because that's what he was referring to. Or it's the fast and then the feast. It's up to you to decide. So if you live out Lent, what is Lent? Fasting, penance, self-denial, asceticism. You really live out, you really live out Lent. What happens on Easter Sunday? We're, we're overflowing with joy because we've, we were able to overcome, hopefully, a lot of our passions, to conquer our sinfulness, direct our focus on God. Yep. So hedonism is very, very prevalent in the modern society. Okay, from hedonism, the next would be agnosticism. Any of you ever hear the word agnosticism? Agnosticism is not atheism. I've often thought philosophically it might even be worse. I'll explain why. It might even be worse. If you know, if you know your Greek, well, a, a means no, nothing. Does, agnosticism, it means not knowing. That's what it means if you go to the Greek. Like atheism, a, no God, okay? This is an all-present prevailing philosophy of total uncertainty. Of uncertainty. Because it is this. May, maybe God exists. Maybe God exists. But maybe he doesn't exist. This person lives in a perpetual state of uncertainty. Doubt. Tension. Confusion. In other words, a perpetual state of limbo. Kind of like a helium balloon. <laughs> Ever seen a helium balloon blown by the wind? So he's usually like a leaf blown about by the wind. I like this image that I wrote. Hopefully you'll like it too. He's like a leaf blown about by the wind of his passions fashions, and popular opinion. Yep. Yep. I have fashions and passions. Yeah, I like the rhyme, don't you? Fashions and passions and popular opinion, which comes and goes as the sun rises and hides itself every evening. It's kind of like... Have any of you ever been on the, on the, uh, on the East Coast? Ever in New, New England? Yeah. What do they have on the top of the roofs of the houses in New England? 
Okay, you got the rooster. I've never seen in the in the West Coast, but in the New England, you got them all over the place. And the wind is going to be blowing the rooster in one direction, and another. And it's called in Spanish una veleta. Okay, it's blown by the wind. No? So people, people, agnostic is kind of like that, kind of blown by, blown by opinion and fashion and blown by his feelings. Okay, I'd like to tell you a, a story that Father Tim Gallagher uh, said and then we can take our break and pursue this in the next hour or 50 minutes. I don't remember the exact topic of Father Tim, but he tells a story of two French philosophers who lived about 100 years ago, maybe a little bit less, 90 years ago. And they were studying, I think, in the Sorbonne. Sorbonne would be the, the Harvard of France back you know, 100 years ago. And it was a man and a woman, very, very keen intellects. And uh, they, they, were, they were agnostics. Agnostics or atheists? I mean, they, were, they lived in this state of confusion. But they had a teacher, a very famous teacher back then. His name was Leon Bloy, who was a very famous theologian and philosopher who lived about 90 years ago. Leon Bloy, B-L-O-Y. So after one year of study, they decided after finishing that, the final semester, if they did not find meaning of life, meaning in life, because they, they were being haunted by, by agnosticism, that they would both together they would both together commit suicide. Okay? Now think philosophically, if, 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 there's, if there's no God after life, you can decide your own future. There's a certain consistency in the thinking of a, an agnostic or atheist. For example, someone who commits suicide, he's doing it because he's pursuing pleasure. He really believed by his non-existence, he's going to enjoy himself more than living the sad fate that he's going through. That's what's in the mind of the person who commits suicide. I will, I will, I will suffer less if I don't exist. Of course, we don't agree with that. We believe in the importance of the cross as redemptive. So this Leon Bloy tells them, okay, before you commit suicide, do me a favor. I want both of you to pray. They looked at each other and they looked at him. Well, what do you mean pray? Well, talk to God. Well, we're not even sure that God exists. And he said, talk to him anyway. <laughs> so given that this man had a real prominence and kind of power over the young people, they decided to pray. And what happened was, God placed in their hands some of the writings of the greatest philosopher and theologian in the world. I've already mentioned him 10 times. I mentioned him at the beginning of my talk, and it was Thomas Aquinas. They fell upon the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas, and they fell in love with Thomas and Aquinas. And they became believers. And both of them eventually were married. Now we who have our degree in philosophy, we've got to study a lot of philosophy, and their names are Jacques Maritain and Raisa. Now most of you are not grounded in philosophy, but anyone who knows philosophy, th those are the most famous Thomists in the past hundred years. Somebody's saying, what the heck is a Thomist? Okay, to okay I'm sorry, okay. Thomas would be a study of the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas. So they're brought out of this state of agnosticism leading to atheism by an encounter with a holy man that prayed for them. 
and in introduce them to the great thinking of Thomas Aquinas, the greatest theologian in the world and one of the greatest philosophers. So that is the erroneous philosophy of agnosticism. So what we'll do is we're going to take our, our short break now, and then we'll come back for our second session, okay? Glory be to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Lady Guadalupe, pray for us, and then you'll hear the bell after the short break. <laughs>